I guess I'm going to have you sit. You're going to see why later. Some of y'all know exactly why there's all this tension going on. I just, my hands are sweaty and everything. I'm not going to do an Eminem rap. I'm not leaning that direction. So what we're going to look at in the text, it is pretty warm in here, so I could also be sweating because of that. But let me just say this. <clears throat> what we're going to look at tonight is pretty simple, pretty clear, it's pretty straightforward, and if you will do what it says, you will be happy. You will be at peace. And I know that sounds too good to be true, too simple and too easy. We say it's not possible because life has taught us differently. We know that people will lie to us. We know people will mistreat us. We know if we give them the opportunity, they're going to take advantage of us. We know they'll twist our words. They'll try to look at what we've done wrong and poorly rather than ever consider anything we've done good. And on top of all this, our own flesh constantly leads us into sin. So naturally, we're rather hesitant to hear claims that if you just do this, you'll be happy and at peace. Yet over the next two Sunday evenings, that's precisely what we're going to hear. And even more, we're going to discover that despite our desires to blame others, to blame the world, to blame politicians and political parties, or even blaming those who are in this room right now for your own misery, for your own unpleasantness, for your own tensions, for your own rifts, for your own displeasure, and whatever else it may be, the truth is, we only have ourselves to blame. How we think, how we look at life and others all play a pivotal role and part in our joy and peace, both now in our life and in the world to come. You know, when we talk about doing good science, we quote Johann Kepler, who's the father of modern astronomy, who says that all science is true good science is merely thinking God's thoughts after him. That's how he discovered the plans of our emotions. He studied the scripture and said, oh, I guess that's how they move. So similarly, we do good, true, accurate Bible study, and we grow in the Lord only as we learn to think as he thinks. And precisely how one thinks is vital. So Paul comes along in these passages we're going to read to remind us, to encourage us that we can and should indeed be at peace and filled with joy as children of the King. As those redeemed for all eternity, we of all people should be the best and the first ones to quickly and actively say, no more, no more stinking thinking. So we invite you to rise now for the reading of God's word from Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4. And as you turn there, I remind you as we do every time that we gather that here at First Presbyterian Church of Crystal Springs, we truly do believe there is only one place in this entire universe we can go to find absolute truth. And it is the Bible. It is the very word of God. Every single word of it is inspired by him. It's an errant meaning it has no errors. What it says is true is true. It's infallible, meaning it will never, ever fails so we can trust it completely. So hear now the word of the Lord from Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received, and heard, and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. The grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. This is the word of the Lord, and the people said, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, would you indeed tear down walls and barriers, rip up stony ground, crush our hearts that we would be made like you. 
We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Like I told you, you read that text and it sounds pretty simple, sounds pretty easy, it's very upbeat. I mean, that's the whole theme of the letter. And it's encouraging you and it gives the guarantee and promise. If you do these things, the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. The guarding, the term that Paul uses there is the same one he would have seen outside the prison, the guards. There's a lot of inside jokes by church fathers and theologians that said that's probably why he wrote the word guard. He's writing a letter, looked up and said, It'll guard you. That's a good analogy. I like this one. But here's the thing. If you want that to happen, you got to do something. If you want joy and peace that can't and won't ever be taken away because it's guarded by the God of peace himself, then you got to do something. And what you have to do is actually pretty simple, but it's not easy because it's going to require a complete rewiring of your brain of how we think, how we act, You know, neuroscientists talk about the fact that the brain, the actual shape and wrinkles in the brain will change as you learn and study things. Learn new disciplines, new behaviors, new information. You literally change the shape and size and direction and everything else of how your brain sits. There's a reason we're to require and wash our minds in the Word of God. Now, before you get defeated... Before you begin to say, well, there's no use in me trying to rewire my brain. Before you say, I'm too old to try to do that, I I hope these young people get it. None of that. I have great news for you. If you indeed belong to him. Now, if you don't, there's any good news for you. If you belong to him, if you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, he will work these things into your life. Therefore, if they're not there yet, And here's what I can tell you. Repent where you need to. That's always going to be the very first thing. If we're not growing in him, it's because we're sinning. Plain and simple. So repent where you need to. Lean in to him in obedience to those commands here that we'll hear tonight and elsewhere in Scripture. So let's jump in. What are these commands? Well, there's five of them, but I believe we do ourselves a big disservice. We just call them commands. We just say, here's the command, do it, because we could be tempted in our own minds to see them as if they're just a one-and-done type deal. You know, go out there and do this. All right, you did it, good. Check it off the list. But that's not what we are getting, and that's not what we are being told. Instead, we're being told that these are things we're to do at all times, in every moment. And here's the thing. If we do, they become the blessing, the balm, the guide, that we really find. So here's what Paul takes us to. So I'd rather rephrase them in a sense instead of five commands, five areas of daily practice, if you will. And as a fair warning, some of these over the next two Sundays are going to be quite challenging and difficult. But the good news is we start kind of soft. This will be a soft one. One that might surprise you a wee bit, but it's still there as a command. And this first one is be happy. Yes, be happy. Happy. Being happy, rejoicing in the Lord is a command. That's why when I look around and look at people and say, you should smile in the Lord. You look like a miserable person. I doubt your salvation because you don't even know how to smile. You know, miserable people, sinful people sit like this. Got nothing to be grateful for, nothing to rejoice in. Paul says, that's not you. You're to be happy. You rejoice. But more than that, he doesn't say, it's a good idea, guys. Let's be, let's be happy people. He says, you will rejoice. You will be happy. You got to love that. And you got to love the fact that Paul's writing this in prison. Hey, isn't it wonderful being in prison? But that's what he's doing. Rejoice always. But here's the thing. This command from Paul is not new. He wasn't sitting around prison because he had a lot of time on his hands and thought, you know what people ought to do? They should be happy. I'm going to go write it down there. Be happy. It's not what happened. One of the earliest commands in Scripture we find involves joy and rejoicing. Leviticus 23, 39 through 41 says the following regarding the Lord's festival of Rosh Hashanah or the Feast of Booths. It says, on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the Feast of the Lord. In case you're ever wondering, that's why we call it Celebrate the Lord's Supper in the bulletins. Just a little side note. You shall celebrate the Feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest. On the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. 
And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days you shall celebrate. It is a feast of the Lord for seven days. It's a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate in the seventh month. Every time that says shall celebrate or rejoice, every one of those is in the command tone from God. He tells you, you're going to honor my festival, and for eight days you're going to be happy. And like, I'm out in the middle of the wilderness. Great, you're going to have eight wonderful days in the wilderness, aren't you? And it sounds silly. I know we look at it and think, what's the point in this? But over and over again, we find Scripture constantly commanding, never suggesting, commanding, rejoice, be happy. The ESV translates Paul's words in verse 4 as rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And so you might say, well, then why say be happy if it's rejoice? Well, the answer is because of the word Paul uses. Paul makes use of a word that connotes a demeanor, an attitude of overall happiness. It's a joy that smiles in the storm. It's a joy that's evident, so evident, in fact, that others say, why are you always happy? You've got nothing to be happy about. Look at your miserable life right now. Why are you smiling? And I'll tell you, if you're a Christian and you haven't been asked that question, you need to start right here. Why aren't you happy? What has God not done for you that's not enough to make you happy? That's the question. We're not being asked. We're being told. You see, you'll always have something positive to consider or recall if you belong to him. It's there. It's just not our tendency to see it. And ultimately, the joy that Paul is commanding is one that grabs hold of, and it turns towards really the source, the underlying currents of joy that's not grounded on anything or anyone else. It's a joy in the Lord. That's why Paul says that. Rejoice in the Lord. This kind of happiness acknowledges his true goodness. It acknowledges his love and his compassion that's always for us, never against us. No matter what we've done, no matter what we've said, no matter where we've gone, he still loves us. This kind of joy that we're being told to have is a rejoicing and happiness that cannot be removed. It is rejoicing and being happy in the Lord that means we find no pleasure in wrongdoing. We're not happy about injustice. We're not happy to hold grudges. We don't happily hear gossip and slander. Because that's garbage. That doesn't lift anybody up. Tell me the good things. Tell me the happy stuff. Let's rejoice in all that the Lord has done. That was me in my old days. I'm a new creation in Christ. Rejoice in the Lord. It means we can honestly smile and look like we have the future that we've been eternally guaranteed in Scripture. And then we're to do it over and over and over and keep doing it until it becomes an internalized, rooted happiness. Here's why this command should motivate you and lift you to obey. See, when this rejoicing in the Lord takes hold, then it's that rooted happiness that you find yourself thrown against and crashing against when you're laying on the floor, unwilling to speak, unwilling to move because of the soul and mind-crushing depression that floods through you. The commanded joy for the Christian teaches us to know, to look for, to listen to that soft voice that still calls in the storm and reminds us and says, it's okay. You are mine. You're going to be okay. I love you. This will pass, but I'll remain with you forever. You see, there's a joy that's in there that only belongs to the Christian. And if you make it your daily practice to be happy, to find something, no matter how small it might be, you see a caterpillar, go, ha, I love this caterpillar, whatever it is, something to be happy and rejoice over and smile about it, then in the deeper, darker times, it will be so much easier 
for you to find and hear him and to find that joy. See, that's not too bad. It's hard, it's heavy, but it's not too bad. That's an easy one. That's nice. Now, it does mean a couple of things. It does mean that you will have to shift and change your normal way of thinking. It's human nature. It's very easy to go around telling everyone what's bad, what's going wrong in our life, what's going wrong in their life, carrying a downcast, slumped shoulder demeanor, looking like this everywhere we go. That's easy. Anybody can do that. Looking for people's sympathy. Maybe even looking for their shock at how we're able to take it all. Look at me. I'm just an amazing person who can bear up all this. But it's the duty, the privilege, and nature of the child of the King of Kings to tell everyone what is great about our God. It's our duty, our privilege to rejoice in so many good things that he's done. It allows us to be in the pits of despair and rejoice because he has never left us and will never forsake us. So you see, that's why it's our duty and our command to smile and be happy. That's the first area of practice, be happy. Now we come to a fun one, one that stands in really direct confrontation with the world, with our own human way of operating, the one that we're going to spend the rest of our time on together tonight, and that is simply this, yield always. Look again at our text and read with me that first part of verse 5, what it says. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Okay? Seems pretty easy. I mean, it says be reasonable. That must be, I mean, be uh, rational. Yeah, don't, don't buy into all the conspiracy theories that are out there. Don't be that crazy guy that everybody knows. You know, be normal. Be reasonable. Be uh, coherent, right? That's what that means, right? That's what I thought it meant as well. And the Holy Spirit, through Paul, takes a much bigger, much harder, much deeper cut with this command. Verse 5 can be more accurately translated and more literal, or yeah, accurately translated as a let your forbearance be known to all men. Translating that out again, show a gentle attitude towards everyone. So that got me thinking, well, what does that mean? What does forbearance mean? If you're commanding forbearance, and it's a word pretty unique to Paul in this letter. So if you're digging on this, what are you saying? Well, the definition of this Greek word that we translate in the ESV as reasonableness means not insisting on every right of letter of law or custom. It means yielding, gentle, kind, courteous, and tolerant. Well, that got my attention. In other words, Paul is commanding, again, not suggesting, commanding under the power of the Holy Spirit as an apostle that you and I, as Christians, are to lay down our rights. Always. I know. You're probably thinking the same way I am. Mm -hmm. Paul commands us to lay down our rights at all times. Lay down what we may even know and believe is ours by right, by law, by custom. And when are we to do it? Once a year? Once a month? Once a week? No. At every single moment of every single day. So what does that look like? What does this mean? What is it we're supposed to be doing every single day? We're going to look at Charles Spurgeon and John Calvin to kind of help us understand a little bit more. Charles Spurgeon spoke on this commanded word of uh, forbearance and its implications, and he says, here's what this means for you as a Christian. Do not get angry with anybody. Do not begin to get fiery and impetuous. Do not push your own rights too far. Stop short of what you might fairly demand. Go not as far as you may, nor even as far as some think that you ought to go in defending your own rights. Let your gentleness, your yieldingness, be known unto all men. Be forbearing. 
That's the commanded daily mindset, attitude, and behavior that Paul is giving. One to which we might say, well, that's hard, but I guess I could do that if it's to other Christians, right? That, that's, at least we just have to do it to other Christians. Or do it only to those who won't take advantage of us because we won't enforce our rights. We know they're going to take advantage of us if we don't do that. So clearly, that's only those cases. Uh, maybe, maybe we're only supposed to yield always only in cases that aren't that important, that don't matter that much. Sadly, the answer is no. You see, we're not given conditions for obedience. We're not told to yield always except for or in cases of A, B, or C. And why is that? I mean, aren't we right to be hesitant and push back on this idea of yielding always? What about our things? What about my stuff, my property, my life? My position. And I'm going to be very, very, very transparent with you about this point. Learning the depth of Paul's words and usage here has been a good and powerful challenge for me, one I'm still not done with. When I learned that Paul meant more than just being an agreeable, reasonable, likable person, which I feel like I do pretty well, but actually commands and demands that I lay down my rights, even, even when they're mine by law. It's hard. This command does mean those things. But let's be clear on a point, something I don't want us to miss in the going deep here. If you're a person that's known as a difficult person, you're the cantankerous one. You're the one people feel they need to prepare themselves for before they go meet and talk to you. You're the person that people tend to just ignore, don't invite out, minimize their engagements with. I'm going to tell you right now, you are not being reasonable. You are not being forbearing. You're not being gentle and yielding. So for you to keep demanding your way you need to know that's not his way at all. So let's not miss that very simple, direct approach. But as we're seeing, it goes far, far deeper. So what did I do when I read this and learned this term? Well, I did what all good Christians do. I said no. I flat out told God, I said no. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. And I don't want to do that. I'll be taken advantage by others. I know it. I've had a career before I became a pastor. I've been in the world for decades, and they will look for every opportunity to take you out if you give it to them. So, I repented. I prayed. I looked more. Only to discover that my protest had already been answered in the same verse, the last part of verse 5. It says, uh, Excuse me, I jumped the wrong verse. Verse 5, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Now this statement is not written as a segue to the next subject. The ESV puts a punctuation in a bad spot, so that just happens. It's not a connection to that next sentence. It's written on its own for one reason and one reason only, to motivate, encourage, and challenge all of us to obey fully and quickly all of his commands, but specifically right here, in laying down, surrendering, and not pursuing what is ours by right or custom. Listen to what John Calvin says about this motivation. He says, for carnal sense, talking about our human nature, rises in opposition to the foregoing statement. Rise, in other words, we reject naturally the idea of laying down our rights at all times. And he goes, for at the rate, as the rage of the wicked is the more inflamed in proportion to the more that we show ourselves agreeable and gentle, and the more they see us prepared for enduring, are the more emboldened to inflict injuries, we are, without, or we are with difficulty induced to possess our souls and patience. Translating a little bit of Calvin, for those who are curious what he's trying to say there. What he's basically saying in just is, 
The world is wicked. It's enraged. And we know because it's so wicked that they're looking for opportunities against us. And when they see those opportunities, they get even more emboldened because they realize we won't fight them and we won't push back. And they keep taking advantage of us. And so, you know, so it becomes very difficult to keep our souls in patience. It keeps on going. Hence the Proverbs of his day, which I like. We must howl when among wolves. That means blend in with them. And those who act like sheep will quickly be devoured by wolves. Now, those are great Proverbs in worldly wisdom. It's not what God says. So Calvin continues, goes, Hence we conclude that the ferocity of the wicked must be repressed by corresponding violence, that they may not insult us with impunity. So you go, see, we automatically assume, ah, no, the world's wicked. We're not going to give up our rights. In fact, we're going to crush them, and we're going to enforce our rights so much so that there's no way for them to hit us back. Here's the thing. You see, we're so worried about justice, so concerned about fairness and what's due to us. And I'm not saying that's wrong. We are to be concerned about justice. But we're so concerned with that that we naturally recoil when told to lay it all down. We get upset about the concept and the possibility and the idea of them not getting what they deserve. Look what they did to me. I have to insist upon my rights so they can suffer and know they were wrong. But truthfully, that fear... Those complaints, they're all nothing more than doubt in and of God. That's what they are. Ultimately, it's a rejection of who he has revealed himself to be. It's a failure to recall that he is indeed returning soon. You see, that trepidation, that outright refusal to obey should be corrected and tempered by the phrase, the Lord is at hand, because it reminds us that all of us, Christians, non-Christians, everyone will stand before the throne of God and give a full account for all things they have said, done, and thought. And on that great day, at that time, all the moments of forbearance, all the moments where we willingly, in obedience to His command, and happily gave up our rights and laid it all down for His sake, On that day, it will be fully settled and resolved by the only one with the right, the law, and the power to do so justly. Now, if you're like me, perhaps you still want to resist. You hear all that and go, I see it, but I don't like it. Well, I'll quickly take you down the path that I've already traveled to try to save you a little bit of time. Begins with a no. Not going to do it. Then it moves to the, okay, fine. What if, what if I try it? What's it going to look like? To which after that is answered, I say, well, Paul, he insisted on his rights. You know, I'm trying to be slick with God. I'm trying to show you that this doesn't work, and it's a foolish idea, but it still happens. I figure I can out-argue God on his text. So he says, this is what we're going to do. I'm like, no, we're not. I said, well, okay, so what if? Fine. What about Holy Spirit? Or what about Paul? And the Holy Spirit says, did he insist on his rights? So looking at what landed him in prison, you realize what led him there to write this letter was this protest and insisting upon his right to make his case and appeal before Caesar. You're like, well, he's insisting on his rights. However, he wasn't doing it to defend himself. He didn't do it to prove himself. He did it for the defense and sake of the gospel. You see, he did it because he started off with them accusing him, and he says, hey, brothers, I'm being accused. He knew what he was doing. I'm being accused of believing in life after death. And then the Pharisees lit up on the Sadducees, and everybody went to fighting. This whole thing breaks out. They're going to arrest him, beat him. All kinds of things happen to him. And the man's like, look, I'm a Roman citizen. Let me appeal to Caesar. But he wasn't appealing for his own sake. He's appealing, as he even said multiple times in his own letters, by his own words, so we're not putting this in his mind. He appealed for one reason, one reason only, that Caesar himself could hear the gospel. He thought, I'm in a great opportunity. I'm a Roman citizen. I can appeal to go to Caesar to use my rights, but I'm really not interested in my rights. I just want to get there and tell Caesar, you need Jesus. And that's what he does. So I said, fine. 
We'll take Paul off the list. I guess Paul wasn't being hypocritical. I guess he really believed in laying down his rights. And I said, well, still no. So then Isaiah 53, 7 comes to my mind. A verse that would later be expounded on by Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch. A scripture that speaks of our Savior. Isaiah 53, 7 says, He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. All right. I think you can see where I'm going. The pressure is mounting on me pretty poorly. Uh, Not only did Paul follow this, but Jesus himself also followed it. And if anyone ever had the right to argue for and insist upon what is his by law, by right, by custom, it was Jesus. And yet, when Jesus stands before Pilate, defend yourself, give me your answer, tell me what's going on, he says nothing. And then willingly is executed on a cross when he did nothing. Laying it down, yielding all ways. So I looked at that for a while. Okay, fine, I guess you got me. But then I had one more clever idea. One last pushback. I said, okay. In clear big issues, fine. What about every single day? What about every single moment? What about little conversations? What about what I want for dinner? To which he gently reminded me of another simple truth. It's time to do it, not just because of the command. That I'm to do it, not even just because of the examples that he shows me through Paul and through Jesus and others. But he says that we're to obey and yield always because it reflects the very nature of the God that we claim to love and serve and desire to live with for eternity. You see, because every single moment of every single day, the great, perfect, holy, mighty God of the universe is faced with either asserting what is his right by law or choosing to lay it aside for the judgment day. You see, none of us has the right to demand our right. None of us have the right to demand our way, our custom, our position, as long as as God himself does not do the same. For only he has the right to demand and insist upon anything. And yet he still yields. Don't believe me? Want proof of yielding? Are you dead? I mean, I know it sounds kind of funny, but it's true. The very fact that this entire existence has not been obliterated and wiped out is only because he's yielding always. So I jump back to Calvin and say, well, maybe Calvin will help me out here. He seems to always say what I'm thinking. Maybe he'll push back and give me an excuse. That's all I'm looking for. I'm no longer even looking, honestly, as a good pastor or even Christian. What do you mean, Lord? I'm more like, how can I get out of this? So I go back to Calvin. And it wasn't until after I traveled this path and walked y'all through it, that's why we spent some time talking about it, that I was able to finally return to his commentary and appreciate the power of what we're about to read together. I'm going to have it on here so you can read along when I read it. But after writing on the command to lay it all down, to yield always, Calvin writes this. Here we have a most beautiful sentiment from which we learn in the first place that ignorance of the providence of God is the cause of all impatience, and that this is the reason why we are so quickly and on trivial accounts thrown into confusion and often, too, become disheartened because we do not recognize the fact that the Lord cares for us. The first part. second part, on the other hand, we learn that this is the only remedy for tranquilizing our minds when we repose unreservedly in his providential care, as knowing that we are not exposed either to the rashness of fortune or to the caprice or wishes of the wicked, 
but are under the regulation of God's fatherly care. And here's the big point of the whole thing. The man that is in possession of this truth, that God is present with him, has what he may rest upon with security. In other words, he says, why do we resist? Why do we not want to yield at all times? Because ultimately, we don't trust God. And we're afraid. We don't realize that our sovereign God is a loving God who cares for us. We actually believe when we behave that way, when we insist upon our rights, what we are declaring and showing and proving with our own actions and words is we truly do not believe God can nor will provide for me unless I do this first. We're saying God's will can't be fulfilled if I don't stand up for myself. You know, we fail to recall his sovereignty in these moments. We shift from trusting what Scripture declares that all we are to have has been and will be given by him with no one able to hinder. We're afraid that he won't bless and provide for us, so instead we turn to our own selves, to our own wisdom, to our own minds to defend, to arbitrate our case. But his love and his goodness are ever present and overwhelming. They remind us that what was done for us was done before the foundation of the world. The gospel message settles in us the truth that everything we have is truly from him, even, even the breath in our body to protest his command, to tell him no. Even that is a gift from God. We have it all because of his own forbearance. We have it because he laid down his rights by law. Even your redemption, your salvation, your eternal secured hope and promise in life only came about by someone yielding and laying down all their rights. Jesus' perfect sinless birth and life and is willingly laying down these rights and taking in their place the guilt, the punishment, the wrath that you and I deserve. That should be more than enough to drive us quickly and willingly to lay down our own rights and, and rules and desires. As I end, let me just put it, be as plain and simple as I can put it. Why should we be able to lay it all down so easily? Because if you're in Christ, you're dead already. That's what we're told. All of us who are in Christ have died already in him. And how many rights and things do dead people have? Now, if you're a conspiracy person, you probably believe they all vote in every election. But jokes aside, how many do dead people have? None. Why? Because they're dead. We too no longer have any rights because we're dead. As it says in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. There's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Therefore, yield always to all people, at all times, in every circumstance, trusting in the goodness and providence and sovereignty of your Father who knows what's actually best and right in every moment. Yield always that you might declare your trust in the Lord who is always near at hand. So tonight, be happy and yield always. Two of the five areas of practice that Paul gives in our text. Two that on their own will take a lifetime's worth of energy. But two that should provide you enough joy and peace even now if you start to put it into practice. Two areas that will radically change not only the enjoyment of your life, but your very outlook and how you will live every single day. Two ways of thinking and acting that will air out that dirty brain of ours and begin to clean away the stinking thinking. So here's the takeaway. For those outside of Christ, 
I'm going to challenge you for this night and the next week and every night, but to have an open mind. And I know the lost love to try to claim the church doesn't have an open mind. They clearly never talk to a real Christian. We probably have the most open mind of anybody. Because once you realize there is a God who's made all things, once you realize that everybody will die unless he returns, then you have to face the fact that there is something that you will do when you draw your last breath, and that is stand before the God who knows all things and commands these very words. You see, a closed mind looks inward. A closed mind uses its own self to determine what's true and what's right. A closed mind will interpret Scripture the own way they want to interpret it, in a way that allows them to live life the way they keep living it. But an open mind is able to see beyond themselves and look to the world as a whole. So outside of Christ, your mind is dark. But if you'll confess and turn to him, he'll bring you, he'll place you from darkness to light. But do that now. Open your mind. For those in Christ, this can be the same takeaway tonight and next week. Pick a practice. Right now you've got two to choose from. Maybe it's both. I don't know where you are. If you're like me, I definitely know one of them for sure I've got a real issue with. Put it to practice. Is it more forbearance? Is it rejoicing always? In fact, all this to practice right now. You know, real fast one. Everybody smile. I'm going to look. If you ain't smiling, I'm going to know. <laughs> so I'm trying to maybe see your smile. Yeah. Be happy. All right? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word. Father, thank you that you love us enough to give us hard words, to command us to change, because you said you will make us like Jesus. And Jesus laid it all down. Jesus rejoiced in all things, rejoicing in every moment, even on the cross, rejoicing, as it says, going with the joy set before him. So Holy Spirit, let us do the same. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.